It's time for the Douglas Coleman Show. Mr. Smooth and Savvy is joined by guests from all walks of life. From the entertainment industry to authors to political and social commentators. The famous and not so famous. The controversial and the light and fluffy. We have it all. Now, here's Douglas Coleman. Well, hello there. Heidi, Heidi, hey there. Welcome to the Douglas Coleman Show. It's me, Douglas Coleman. How are you? Hope everybody is staying safe. I was thinking about doing one of those, uh, you know, this is day 35 of lockdown, but changed my mind on that idea. Hopefully this won't go on for too much longer and we can all get back to our lives. I think a lot of people are going stir crazy. Anyways, we've got two interviews. We've got some music to play today. First one up is Ray Powers. Ray is a singer-songwriter, musician, second generation, his father, Ray Sr. was a vocalist in Brooklyn a cappella doo-wop groups, The Deacons and the Montclairs. And Ray's got a new album out, and we're going to be featuring one of the tracks from the album called It's You. Nice track. Ray will be up first, followed by a returning guest, Deanna Lorraine. And Deanna was a congressional candidate. She ran in San Francisco's 12th district against Nancy Pelosi. Unfortunately, she lost in the primary, but she's still very active politically. She's also an author. She's writing a book, and she's got a YouTube channel and a podcast. So check her out at DeannaLorraine.com. After the interviews, we've got music. We've got one track from a Music X-Ray submission and, and two tracks from Music Submit submissions. Thank you to everybody who's been submitting. We've got lots of great music to play. Sorry we're a little backed up, but we will get to your music in good time. First one up, Music X-Ray is called Better Days Ahead by Freon Cool. And then the two tracks from Music Submit. First one is Driving Time by Papa Satch, followed by Gets Me the Most by Renee Miller. So not much time to chit-chat. We will be right back with Ray Powers. You're listening to Mr. Smooth and Savvy right here on the Douglas Coleman Show. We'll be right back after these commercial messages. Hi there, this is Stuart Epps, record producer. This is my story about Elton John, uh, working with him in those early years, going back to 1967 at Dick James, uh, all the amazing tours, those first recordings, uh, going through to Rocket Records, and uh, it's an amazing story about his incredible rise to stardom and my part in that. So uh, look forward to taking you on that journey. So here we go. Yeah, and to order this great audio CD, please just email me at stuartepps at talk21.com. That's Stuart, S-T-U-A-R-T, Epps, E-P-P-S, at talk, T-A-L-K, 21 in figures, dot com. Stuart Epps at talk21.com. Email me and I'll give you all the details for buying this brilliant audio disc. Thank you. Bye. DJC Music and DJC Productions are pleased to announce a brand new website. We have started a listing website for radio show hosts as well as potential show guests. This is a meeting site where hosts and guests can come together. Show hosts can list their show and types of guests they're interested in booking. Potential guests can list their talents, bio, accomplishments, or anything they feel makes them an interesting radio show guest. There are no recurrent payments, only a one-time $5 listing fee. Your listing will stay up until you decide to cancel. Previous guests of The Douglas Coleman Show are welcome to submit their guest listing free of charge. Go to radiohostsandguests.com. That's radiohostsandguests.com. Tired of living in a culture of lies, fake news, and alternative facts? The Pro-Truth Pledge reverses the tide of lies by calling on politicians, and everyone else, to commit to truth-oriented behaviors. The Pledge asks signees to commit to 12 behaviors that research in behavioral science shows 
lead to truthfulness, such as clarifying one's opinions and the facts, citing one's sources, and celebrating people who update their beliefs toward the truth. Private citizens who sign the pledge get the benefit of contributing to a more truth-oriented society. Public figures get more substantive rewards for signing the pledge in the form of positive media and public recognition. The pledge crowdsources the truth by asking volunteers to evaluate the statements of public figures who sign the pledge. Take the pledge, demand that your elected representatives do so, and encourage your friends to take it at protruthpledge.org. Acclaimed author of Garden, Jane Yates brings you the first book in a new trilogy, Octopus Pirate, a story of a foundling who has unusual talents such as the ability to communicate with octopuses. As a baby, he was washed up on an island off the Scottish mainland. An eccentric former nun who lives alone with cats brings him up. He joins a circus and narrowly escapes plots against him, flees to Cornwall, builds a replica pirate ship that's also an airship to travel back in time to fight real pirates. Get your copy today from Amazon, only 99 cents. Are you an independent musician? How would you like to have your songs played on hundreds of radio stations just like the one you're listening to right now? Join MusicSubmit.com and we'll promote your music to radio stations and blogs in your genre. It's free to set up your account and we guarantee your music will be considered for airplay by radio stations worldwide. Why not sign up today? It's free. MusicSubmit.com Radio promotion for indie musicians. I'm coming as fast as I can. And now... Hey, Rocky, watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. Again? Nothing up my sleeve. Presto! Ooh, don't know my own strength. Now here's something we hope you'll really like. Hey, hey, this is Ray Powers. Don't touch anything. You've got it right where you need it. Tuned in to the Douglas Coleman Show. You heard me. Okay, please welcome to the Douglas Coleman Show, Ray Powers. Hey, Ray, how are you? Hey, Douglas, how you doing? Thanks so much for having me. Oh, thank you for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Uh, let's see, you are a musician, songwriter. Uh, you came through Michael Stover. Your father was a prominent bass vocalist in the Brooklyn a cappella doo-wop groups, the Deacons and the Montclairs. Do you know a guy named um, Al Contrera? You know, the name rings a bell, but, I mean, it could be derivative of either of those names. It could be the surname. It could be, uh, you know, there are just so many people that have come and gone. Okay. And well, it's such a small community, so, I mean, very possibly. Well, maybe this one would have been more in your father's day. Um, he was also in a Brooklyn doo-wop group back in the 50s called The Mystics, and they had a, a hit called Hushabye, uh, which was covered by the Beach Boys a few years later. So, I don't know, it just when I saw Brooklyn a cappella, the reason I, I mention him is because he was on the show uh, about three or four months ago. Right. Nice guy. Well, he's still going, huh? They're still going, yeah. I guess they get together every once in a while and uh, have a, you know, 19th reunion <laughs> concert or whatever. Exactly. I mean, I don't think they're doing anything 69th right now. 69th reunion. Yeah, 69th reunion. I don't think they're doing anything right now, of course, but um, he just wrote a book called oh, wow. something called like, The Mystics and the Mob, and it was some kind of a connection about <laughs> about the, uh, the doo-wop groups in those days. Many of them were of Italian heritage and in Brooklyn. Oh, yeah. And uh, I guess there was a lot of mafia connections with uh, Paola and whatever else, you know. But I'm sure it's an allegedly, interesting book. Right? Allegedly, <laughs> allegedly. I'm sure it's an interesting book. I haven't read it just yet, but it's in my stack of many books to read. So anyways, I got to ask the obligatory question that I've been asking everybody. How are you doing with the virus situation? Are you locked in at home? What virus situation? No, um, <laughs> you know, we're doing what we can. I'm working out, cooking, catching up on some outdoor landscaping, 
And uh, one of the impetuses to pushing up the release of this album I have was I knew people would be home and they'd be needing more entertainment. So that was kind of a motivation to get my you-know-what together and get this album out. Where are you calling from? I am calling from right outside New York City, uh, Bergen County, New Jersey. I can see the New York skyline from my house. Oh, okay. So you guys are you really because state by state, some people are on mandatory lockdown, some are voluntary lockdown, and so I guess you're one of the uh, you know armed guards at the door to keep you in your house, yeah. Just about, but I mean, you know, I go out jogging and I try to hit the store in the morning, and I, you know, it's it's common sense, and a lot of it is just respect people. If they don't want you near them, don't go near them. But I'm I talk to my neighbors and whatnot, but. Again, it's just case by case, be smart. That's how I look at it. Well, I agree. You know, there's there's no reason to uh, offend thy neighbor if, uh, right. you know, you don't go out on your lawn and start hacking up a lung and blowing it over that direction, <laughs> you know. We're not licking each other quite yet. Or licking each other, right, you know, big wet kisses in the morning, things like that, no. Uh, exactly. So tell me a little bit about your growing up. It sounds like you had an interesting father. Did he push you to play music or did you just do it on your own? You know, actually, ironically, my dad had the musical talent, but it was my mom who really pushed because they, even more so than my dad, my dad has relative pitch, very good relative pitch, but he discovered that I had perfect pitch at six. So my mom was like, you are taking piano lessons. And I did for four years. Best thing that ever happened. Uh, I was able to develop a musical ear. I had the musical aptitude, but of course it was, you know, now it was fostered. And I developed musical theory. I taught myself how to play guitar, then bass. And it put me in countless bands and really got me where I am today. Dad was very hands-off, but he said, if you want to do it, he would give me all the blessings in the world. Well, because sometimes parents who have been artists actors, you know, writers, anything in the creative yeah. endeavors, don't necessarily encourage their kids to do it because they know it's not easy. And they know that it's right. a lot of hard knocks and it's a uh, feast or famine. And so they don't always push their kids. But, uh, well, that's interesting that your mother did. Uh, how did you like taking piano lessons? I honestly didn't mind it. I found it very fascinating. And you know, I know a lot of kids, when they're forced to take the violin and they feel like it's a chore, they dread it. But I had a very, very good teacher. It was my first grade teacher who happened to be a Catholic nun. I went to Catholic school for five years. And she was a concert pianist before she entered the convent. But she was such a cool lady, a very, an older lady, but so cool. And she knew exactly how to handle each child. And it was a fantastic experience for me. I enjoyed every minute. Because I took piano lessons. I'm also a musician, but I, I took piano lessons when I was a kid, and I absolutely hated it because I was <laughs> I was self-taught. I mean, I already knew how to play chords and some basic right. things. And then when I got to the piano lessons and they're having me sit up and, you know, the, the posture with the hands. And, yeah. and I'm like, no, I can't do that. I want to do my C chord this way, you know. And... Exactly. I ju it just didn't work for me. So, I mean, I think I lasted about two weeks with that woman, and then <laughs> I was done. I think it's harder once you know you already develop a skill. And I think the teacher at that point was at a disadvantage. With me, she got me nice and raw and moldable. Oh. And uh, even though I do listen, I learn quicker by ear. You know, I at least had the uh, – she got me at a good age where, you know, she was able to uh, impress upon me this is how you start. Had I been in your shoes, I would have been in the same problem. I had this, I had the same problems with other things where I think I know everything already and it works against me. <laughs> well, what's interesting is it's much more difficult to learn music theory once you can play by ear. Yeah. But then if you, if you struggle through it, then at the end of it, you kind of go, Oh, it's like a roadmap to where you already went basically. Right. And, you know, I'm not great at theory, but I understand some of it. And now it sort of helps me because when I'm writing, I can sort of fast track to certain things that right. before on the piano, I just have to sit there 
and and literally find the note, you know. But there, right, there's to hunt a, for it, yeah, yeah, to hunt for it, and and so now it, it can be quicker if you understand the theory about it. So, I mean, it's good and bad, but it's not. It I wouldn't say it's absolutely necessary. Would you? I mean, it's a tool, no. right? Well, it all depends. If you're going to be in the orchestra pit at the Met, then yes, you absolutely need it. Um, I still get charts on the road. You mentioned the Mystics. That's one of the few doo-wop groups that I haven't backed on the road. But often I will get um, different charts because the musical director has different interpretations of the songs. You know, maybe they have uh, different cuts. They have different arrangements. So it does come in handy to know both, to be able to both transpose in my head, but, you know, at least recognize the music in front of me. So I think it all depends on your age, too. You know, she got me nice and young and mobile. If I was 25, I think I would have been sunk if I was trying to start out at that age. <laughs> so so you're one of those guys that can read the dots very quickly, yeah? Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm not quickly anymore. Unfortunately, I took classical piano for three years, but then I discovered Little League and said, ah, I want to do this. And then by that time I was 13, I wanted to grow my hair out long and impress the girls with the guitars. Oh. So yeah. I didn't go back to it until quite a few years later, but I could still read. Um, I, it's better if I read once or, once or twice. It's very tough to sight read like some of these union guys can do on the fly. Right. I, I can do it, but... And then, of course, bass. You know, I'm playing bass clef, so I've got to think in reverse now. It's not the melody. It's, it's you know, the left hand. Exactly. What bands have you been in? Well, as far as rock bands, um, nobody who's really shook the world. I had a couple of spec deals with Sony, a lot of these, you know, um, bogus deals. I mean, they weren't really anything that was going to go anywhere. A band called Inner Soul, which I, I co-founded. My very first Christian band was called Bliss. I was 16, 15 rather. I was playing keyboards, and uh, that didn't really take off. And here and there, I was... Uh, a fill-in guy. I played bass as my main instrument, so I was a hot commodity as far as my, this guy's got the flu, can you can you fill in here or whatever. But when I was able to finally get on the big stages with some of the bigger agencies and back some of these Rock and Roll Hall of Fame acts, you know, that's where um, I got my a lot of my tour mileage in. Are you a full-time musician at this point, or do you do something else as well? Um, I would say it's 50-50 now. I have a promotional company, I've got a daughter who's going to need to go to college in eight years. So obviously I wanted to double down and I didn't want to be able to, uh, I didn't want to have to depend on solely that. And thank God, like now, you know, I've kind of got my bases covered a little bit. I'd be screwed right now. I've lost two oh, yeah. months worth of dates. And I feel for anybody who's a full timer who only does this because, you know, right now everything, hopefully a lot of this will be postponed and rescheduled, but you know, some of it might not be. Yeah, the uh, the on the road is closed at this point, and yeah, Vegas is closed. Yeah, <laughs> Vegas is now. closed. Yeah, it's an amazing sight. I mean, it's hard to even comprehend. You know, all the lights are off, and I can't even imagine. It's it's sort of scary. You know, it's um, it's just something that we've never seen in our lifetime before, and I hope we never see again. But uh, Amen. I don't know. What do you think about uh, the, the people starting to protest now that they want to reopen the, the country? I mean, there's a it's a real f funny well, fine line argument because it's uh, the idea of our civil liberties versus public safety. Yeah, I, I can see both sides of it. I mean, yeah. listen, I'm, I'm one of those people where I want to go out and start working again because I haven't had a sniffle since 1998. And I don't think I'm jinxing it by saying that. But if you want to sit home, if you feel like, you know, you're vulnerable, by all means, sit home. I think the people who can work, I said, let them go out and work. Be smart about it. You know, I mean, there's got to be a fight. There's got to be a middle ground somewhere. I don't think shutting down the country until 2022, until they have a proper quote unquote vaccine is realistic. But, you know, at the same time, if you feel like you're older and you don't want to go out, there are plenty of people out there who want to go out and work. So I think... Yeah, there's, there's, we can find a common ground. I think we'll be able to slowly get back to where we were and better. I think people at this point are going to rush back out as soon as they're able to and go to the movies, go to concerts. You know, they want the economy to come roaring back. So there's that motivation to get it done. Oh, absolutely. 
And I think some states have just been way over the top. I mean, I've been yeah. reading stories where, well, Home Depot's open, but you can't buy grass seed or lawn fertilizer, but you can buy paint. And I mean, who's making these decisions that, you know, the paint is somehow an essential item, but grass seed isn't? I mean, either the store be open or be closed, one way or the other. I don't I don't like the yeah, idea like, that they're res like, yeah. restricting particular items within the store. That just doesn't make much sense to me. Yeah, micromanaging is counterproductive. I don't understand it. It's just, again, let, you know, give people at least... If you're going to let them leave their house, if you're going to let them file their own taxes, at some point, you've got to let them be adults and be responsible. I think 99% of people are going to make the right decision. You know, I mean, don't go having uh, wild orgies. Don't be having parties where you're sharing needles. I mean, the common sense stuff. I hope, I hope that's not uh, too much for a family show, but you know what I mean. As far yeah. as just showing the same common, you let someone get behind the wheel of a car. You're trusting that they're going to make the right decision. You know, there has to be that, uh, I guess, that discretion. Yeah. And I think particularly in the United States where we're used to having our freedom to go to the store when we exactly. want to go, to buy what we want to buy, and all of a sudden to have that pretty much taken away, it's scary for us. You know, it's, it's not something we're accustomed to. People in other countries where they have a real tyrannical government you know, it's a daily occurrence. They're just used to it. But we're not in this country. And I think some people are having a hard time dealing with the idea. Well, I think I think the problem was, and just like with uh, some of the recent historical um, medical coverage that we've been either told we can have or are forced to have, once you tell people you can't or you must, it raises their dander and it changes their outlook yeah. completely. That's exactly if you suggest right. something, it's one thing. If you tell them you have to do this, you can't do this. Hold on a second. I'm American. These are my rights. Yeah, it's a very, very fine line. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. Exactly right. And this uh, virus has pushed everybody to the brink as far as what their rights are. You know, I do see both sides of it, but I, I think you're right that there has to be a middle ground somewhere because I don't think we can go on like this for too much longer. Uh, the economy is just going right. to collapse. Yeah, but, you've got to respect authority, but at some point, authority has to also recognize that they work for the people. Exactly. So you're right. There is a middle ground. Yeah. Well, let's talk about your album. You said like, that being uh, a captive was the inspiration to get this thing. Was it, was it an album that was sitting around for a while that you just decided I better hurry up and finish it or you had time to finish it? Well, having the time to finish, it was one of the few uh, bright spots. It's called Decade of Singles, and it's basically a roundup of, you know, some singles I've had out from 2011 till now, with, of course, some unreleased material. And up until May 1st, when it officially releases, I've got this really cool deluxe package with the full liner notes and lyrics and photos and 30 minutes of video and a really cool special surprise that I'm only really able to... Uh, furnish until release date because then it, it's going to be a free for all at that point. But yeah, I just figured it wasn't going to be till probably the third quarter that it was going to be out. And we figured, well, people are going to be home. You know, they can certainly use uh, something else to occupy their time. They're going to burn through Netflix quickly. They're going <laughs> to read all their books. Yeah. You know, hey, what? I can give them 60 minutes of music and 30 minutes of video. Why not? Yeah, I've been watching all kinds of old movies that I haven't had time to watch. Unbelievably bad stuff. But, uh, you know, <laughs> it's something to do. Uh, we've got two of your tracks here. Michael sent over Gotcha, or Gotta. Gotta. And it's you. Uh, we have time to play one. Which one would you like us to play? Uh, let's see. Do you like upbeat or do you like something a little more deep? Up to you. And this is the one song we can feature in the interview. So whichever one you think Let's showcases you better. Let's go with It's You. That was really my first, uh, I'll call it a hit. And uh, that was the one that kind of put me on the map or at least got me to the point where I was able to release other songs like Goddess. So I would say It's You is my first. And unlike other people who say, they're all my babies, I can't pick a favorite. It's You is my favorite. Okay, and now this says a 2020 remaster, so uh, when was it originally recorded? 
Uh, this was originally released in 2013. Okay. And, uh, of course, the whole collection is now remastered for for 2020. But, uh, yeah, it's the same basic song, but remixed, remastered, just a little polish on it. Otherwise, we left it alone. And you wrote this song, I take it? That particular one, I wrote the lyrics and the music, yes. Okay. What are you playing? Are you singing? Actually, no, I do. I sing lead on sing? that. And oh, okay. I actually played everything on that except for the drums and the lead guitar. So I had some help with that, but, you know, limited budget, indie, uh, indie label, did most of it myself, all I could do myself. All right, great. Well, I'm dying to hear it now because I haven't listened to these yet. This is well, It's you. you by Ray Powers. <laughs> Wasn't born with the keys to a kingdom. That's okay, I'm not looking to reign. I never wanted a parade, always thought I had it made. Getting by to make the grade. Nothing else in the world like contentment. What a life when you get what you need. is bright now I know what makes a lie baby it's you you're the kiss at the end of the movie it's you sun that sets at the end of the day it's you you're the reason that I'm lying awake you're the icing on the cake you're the shimmer on the lake the only heart It uh, has an 80s flavor to it. Yeah, uh, that's something I'm not going to be able to get away from. I'm 50 this year, so <laughs> they say that you cut your teeth, so to speak, when you're between the ages of 12 and 16. 
that puts me at you know 1983 to 87 so well i, I agree uh, with you because most of the stuff i write sounds like from the 70s and i just can't get it out so cool. you know why not yeah it's part of you yeah um, yeah, I think it's in your DNA at that point. It is. It really is. And all the stuff you listen to at that point in your life, that's what gets stuck inside, you know? Yeah. Um, I mean, people go on and they discover other things as they get older. But it's that stuff that you listened to when you were a teenager that that happened to be around at that point was is really what gets ingrained, it, especially with songwriters, I find, that it just, that's it, Yeah. you know? Um, there was it's indelible. It's a, yeah. There was one band that uh, it, the song kind of echoed a little bit of. Not that it sounded like the song particularly, but just uh, you know the band Survivor. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, I had uh, Jeff Byron on a little while ago, and I don't know something about oh, your cool. your song just reminded me of Survivor. I don't know why. Uh, but it's well, it's probably the same time frame, so maybe that's it. Yeah, you know? that's high praise in my book because I love Survivor and you know Tatarik and those guys to me were role models growing up. I loved Survivor, Poor Man's Son, and stuff way before I had the Tiger. Even the later stuff. I mean, fantastic group. Funny song with it's you is I was actually asked to indirectly pay homage to three specific, and I tell the story in, in the video um, a part of that package I'm, I'm releasing, but they said, give me three artists that really had impact in your career. And I listed three people, and they said, okay, try to put a very, very subtle tag in the song. It's you. Without, of course, ripping the group off, but you know that was one of the challenges that one of my friends who was an industry professional had issued to me. And when he listened to it, he said, yeah, I think you did it. Oh, well, okay. Then maybe that's what I picked up on. Maybe I found it or heard Possibly. it for some reason. And I haven't thought about Jeff or Survivor since he's been on the show. <laughs> and it was a few months ago that, that he was on. And uh, But all of a sudden, as soon as I started listening to that, it's like, oh. And then it just it took me back to to the interview I had with him. So, interesting. That's company I would keep 100% of the time. I would love to open for Survivor. And uh, when they come back around again, I'll have to check them out again. Yeah, definitely. I think Jeff would probably still be playing. He's playing keyboards with them now. I, he wasn't one of the original guys, but uh, I think he says he's he's been with them for, I don't know, three or four years, something like that. So Yeah, that's the case with so many people. I mean, it's so hard to keep an original group together that started out 40 years ago. I mean, you have to stay healthy. You've got to stay alive, obviously, right. active in music. And you, um, and you and, gotta, I mean, how hard is it to keep a marriage together, <laughs> let alone four or five people? Well, that's what I was going to say. And you got to still like each other. I mean, that's what happens with a lot of them, you know, yeah. is that they just get sick sick of each other. Although I understand that uh, Daryl Hole and John Oates don't see each other until they hit the stage. That's what I'm told. I've heard so I that. Guess. And I also, a few years ago, saw Tears for Fears. And, and the two guys are exactly the same way. Apparently, they had separate dressing rooms in the back. And when they came out on stage, one came from one side of the stage and one came from the other side. Wow. <laughs> you know, and they never looked I, at each I other did. on stage. I mean, it was pre it was pretty obvious that they didn't uh, really get along <laughs> too much. But uh, they played together great. Money talks, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I guess Fleetwood Mac was like that for a while, uh, where they would travel in separate jets, apparently. They had that much money. And uh, you know would arrive at the at the venue separately and all separate accommodations, and then they would just get on stage, do the music. I mean, it's, a lot of acrimony, I guess, when you when you're sleeping with each other and then you break up, and you know these things will happen. Yeah, well, I, I think it was particularly bad, nasty for Fleetwood Mac. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. When when you've got cross bedrooms and. <laughs> God only knows. They always say, yeah. They always say, don't sleep with the chick singer, no matter how pretty she is. Nothing good will happen. Well, I don't know that it's a good idea to sleep with anybody in your band. I mean, I think that just True. creates problems all the way around. You got anything else you want to mention before we cut this off? Uh, website or anything? 
Sure. Well, the best place, if you want to get this new album, it's called Decade of Singles 2011-2019. Up until May 1st, the official release date, you can get the special pre-order pack. It's a deluxe pack. Really, really cool bonuses. Just email me at theraypowershour at gmail.com. Otherwise, go to ReverbNation.com slash Ray Powers. Okay, very good. Ray, thanks so much for coming on. This was a lot of fun. Thank you for sharing your music Douglas, with us. thank you. And uh, best of luck. I hope uh, your album does well. Stay healthy out there, and uh, let's get back to work, huh? Yeah, let's do that. I'm, I'm sick of staying at home. All right, take care, man. <laughs> thanks, Doug. <laughs> Bye-bye. Hi, this is John Morgan, production supervisor for DJC Productions. You're listening to The Douglas Coleman Show. Okay, please welcome back to The Douglas Coleman Show, Deanna Lorraine. Hey, Deanna, how are you? I'm great. Hanging in there. How about you? Oh, doing all right. Doing all right. Just to refresh people's memory, uh, you are challenging U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi for her seat in the 12th Congressional District in California. What happened to the primary? Did that get uh, moved? Uh, no, the primary was last month, and it did not get moved. It actually, I mean, this was the first year it was moved forward. Normally it's June, but uh, this year in California they moved the primary to uh, March. And um, unfortunately, I lost to a radical socialist. Oh, So no. now... Yeah, so now it's just it's Nancy Pelosi or a radical socialist going into the general election in November. So it's the only two choices, um, pick your poison. There is no Republican <laughs> candidate on the ballot. Okay, so what are you doing now then if, if your uh, run is over? Well, I'm continuing to stay on the front lines of the fight. You know, I've got to be there. Now that there's no conservative voice or choice to counter Nancy, um, I feel like it's even more important for me to be a prominent voice in uh, in this culture war and this political war to reelect our president. I'm putting a lot of energy to get the vote out, to try to get him reelected, uh, to counter the left. I'm writing a book right now uh, to uh, talk about my experiences fighting Nancy Pelosi in the swamp. And I'm also doing a podcast a couple of days a week, stream from my YouTube, Twitter and a couple other places. I did see one of your videos, and I had to laugh. So I thought I would bring this up about uh, Andy Cuomo's nipple piercings. Um, oh, my gosh. I just thought that was the funniest <laughs> video. And, uh, you know, I'm all for civil liberties. I don't care what people... If he wants to wear pink silk panties and fishnet stockings in the privacy of his own home, that's his business. But when you come on yes. television... For the world to see, I think he should have covered uh -huh. that up because that just is, yeah. you know, uh, that was disgusting. He probably could have gotten worn an undershirt or two. Or two. I mean, did he not know that that shirt was transparent, that, he, that you could see that? Maybe he didn't. <laughs> I don't know, but it was so disgusting. You know, once you saw it, you couldn't unsee it, especially coming from him, you know, <laughs> who's not the most... Uh, respectful person in general well no and then I, I hate to be you know sort of age biased but isn't he a little old for that i mean isn't that kind of like younger guys who don't have man boobs already i mean isn't you know it's like for guys that are in shape that do stuff like that yeah i would think so <laughs> i think it's kind of more of like a college or 20 something thing to have that probably not someone in their 50s yeah i mean but to eat uh, it's their own. <laughs> God. So, anyways, I had a laugh. I thought that was very funny. Uh, your video, so <laughs> of the day, the trending news of the day, uh, even if it happens to be Andrew Cuomo's nipple rings. <laughs> well, you know, I think that is important. I think it's important for people to know that uh, their governor has these extra pieces on him. That uh, for whatever reason, maybe his wife likes them. Who knows? I don't even want to think about it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so uh, so what are you thinking about this whole coronavirus craziness? And how is, your, how is your city taking it? You know, here in California, we're on complete lockdown. We have been for about a month. And, uh, you know, we can't go to no restaurants, bars, churches, gyms. Everything shut down. Even the beach 
is shut down. So it's been difficult over here. Uh, you can you can go to some grocery stores. Some grocery stores have a have a quota of how many people they can let in at one time. Uh, so it's pretty crazy. Well, it's not quite as bad here uh, in Nevada, but everything's shut, so there's nowhere to go. You know, they're not telling mm-hmm. you you have to stay home, but by the same token, I mean the casinos are closed. Once you close all the casinos in Las Vegas, what else is there to do? You know, nothing. I know. Yeah, really. What is there to do? It seems <laughs> so, very depressing. you know, we're oh, essentially, boy. yeah, we're essentially on a lockdown. But uh, what do you think about all the virus thing? I mean, now all the news is coming out that, you know, that the thing escaped from the Wuhan laboratory, which I believe anyways. I never believe the bat soup theory. That's you know, ridiculous. That's ridiculous. yeah. But my only question now really is, did it escape accidentally or was this intentional? Because for me, it seemed awfully convenient. If you look at what was going on just prior to this virus pandemic happening, China was in the midst of a heated trade war with uh, with President Trump, and he was really putting the thumbscrews to them, which nobody had done for decades. At the same time, uh-huh. they were having uncontrollable protests in Hong Kong with people demanding their freedoms and they don't want anything to do with communist China. All that was going on. And then all of a sudden this virus comes and it, and it magically wipes away all of those problems for China. So, yeah, yep. you know, Very convenient. it just, it's, it seems a little convenient to me it makes me very suspicious. Well, so go yes, ahead. But I do believe that too many coincidences, add up and they may not just be coincidences and we have a right to ask questions especially when our freedoms have been completely impinged on and you know we we have gone on a global house arrest basically in the blink of an eye so we have a right to ask questions when certain things don't add up and don't make sense well i agree so how do you feel about the argument between civil liberties versus public safety where do you think uh where do you think we should do with this i mean should we just open the country back up and let the virus do what it's going to do? Or do we keep it locked down until, I mean, we can't keep it locked down until they get a vaccine. That's going to be months and maybe years. But what do you think? Yeah, definitely not that. Where do you think the balance should be? I think that we need to honestly use common sense. We have never, you know, we have the seasonal flu every single year. We had the swine flu, too, which killed hundreds of thousands of people. And the the seasonal flu has killed more people every year than the coronavirus has. Now, I'm not saying that coronavirus isn't real or that it's not serious, but we just have to also look at the numbers. And we never shut down the whole country and the economy and took such drastic measures in the, during the seasonal flu every year. We've never did it with the swine flu. And we got by just fine. You know, we ended up going, you know, moving forward and, 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 uh, and getting better as a country and the summer hit and we kind of, you know, kind of what goes away. So, you know, the common sense, they've been pushing it hard enough. People are already scared, you know, to, to even be within 12 feet of somebody now. So I think people are really been taking, you know, taking these precautions seriously now that they're in a habit of it. You know, the, I think everything should be open by May 1st unless there's a serious reason why certain districts shouldn't be, if there's a significant number of cases, um, everyone's already, you know, with the caution of like, you know, maybe um, if obviously if you're not feeling well at all, don't go to work, don't stay home before people would sort of push themselves to go to work because they, they didn't want to take the time off or they were feeling guilty uh, to, to miss work. If they just kind of felt a little bit under the weather, weather, but now it's kind of a free pass to say, if you're feeling even a little bit under the weather, don't go to work, don't go to a social event, stay home. Um, and I, I honestly think that common sense mixed with this, this habit now of being extra precautious, I think that we're going to be fine. And we do not need to give up our liberties, for God's sake, for the sake of perceived safety and health. I just don't think that's the case because it's a very slippery slope after that. Oh, I agree. And and the economy won't won't bear it. We we're down. We've been down what about a month now, maybe. Mm-hmm. And you know, perhaps we could go one more month. 
but that would be about it. I think after that, um, it's possible that they could run the schools out because they were going to go out, what, at the end of May anyways. So you've got the three months of the summer off. Perhaps the schools could stay closed until September. But everything else, I think, needs to start opening up. Restaurants, yeah. bars, airlines, you know, that kind of stuff that just, it, it needs to start opening. Guys, if crazy people, you can't imagine, you know, the sports. I, you know, we've never, at least in my lifetime, I've never heard of the NBA shutting down or sports centers, sports leagues, everything, Disney World, you know, shutting down. These are these are huge industries. It's it's incredible. It's it's really it's really it's really crazy. And I think, you know, what Trump keeps saying is that the um, you know, that the cure can't be worse than the illness itself. And we're starting to get to that point. That's true. And I definitely yeah. don't think, you know, with Fauci saying and Bill Gates saying we shouldn't open the country back until uh, vaccine and a tracking and monitoring system has put been put in place. Hell no. No, no one should ever accept that. That is unacceptable. That is a grave uh, impinging on our freedoms. And we're better than that. We don't need a mandatory vaccine to cure this, to get through this. And we don't need some sort of tracking and monitoring system, I think, to pull through this and to reopen the country. Oh, God, no. No, especially not one created by Bill Gates. <laughs> well, he's got the power to do it. I mean, I think micro, if anybody could do it, Microsoft probably has the capabilities to uh, somehow monitor you through your windows. Yeah. Which is kind of scary. Very. So you got a, what is your, your book? You, you said you're writing a book? Yeah, the book is called 21 Things I Learned, Challenging Nancy Pelosi and Fighting the Swamp. <laughs> is it is it out or are you just still writing it? It's, I'm still writing and it should be out by the midsummer. So in time for, you know, to continue on with this election season. Okay. Well, um if you would like to come back when your book comes out, I would be happy to promote yeah. it. Yeah. You want to do that? Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to. Okay. All right. Well, that sounds good. We'll make a tentative date for sometime in the summer. Okay. Keep keep us posted. Uh, yeah, send an I'll email. Follow- Send an email to John and let him know when the book comes out, and we'll uh, we'll get you back on and we'll talk about it. Okay, that sounds great. Really appreciate you having me on your show, and please stay healthy and safe, and uh, and wear that face mask, especially in California. They're giving thousand dollar tickets if you don't wear a face mask in public. Oh wow! Yeah, it's pretty crazy. All right, well, take care. Okay. You stay safe. <laughs> Thank you.
Sometimes what gets me the most Oh